Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, um, it's uh, day two of the Future Security Forum. My name is uh, Ian Langford, and I'm the Executive Director of Security and Defence Plus, which I'll talk about more shortly. But uh, firstly, I want to uh, acknowledge and uh, state my appreciation for all of you taking time out of your busy lives, and for many of you uh, having to balance your important responsibilities with the opportunity to contribute to a very important discussion to be here today. Uh, I really appreciate the time and effort you've made, particularly those that have travelled from great distance. We've got friends here from Europe, from the UK, we've got a couple from Australia, we've got many from throughout uh, the US, uh, and that all comes with some effort and a degree of sacrifice. So. Again, it's a great privilege to be here in your presence. I really want to acknowledge the efforts you've made and look forward to a, uh, a really positive contribution from you today. Uh, also worth acknowledging those that are online. For those who aren't aware, we have uh, a live stream of this activity today. And I know we have people dialing in from not only the AUKUS jurisdictions of Australia, the UK and throughout uh, here in the US, but also from other friends and partners across the Indo-Pacific region, across Europe, who all are part of a community of interest and practice on defence and security in the context of a world that I think we would all increasingly describe as volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Uh, it also would be remiss of me not to acknowledge uh, the success of the first day of the Future Security Forum and state my appreciation to uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Peter Berg and, and Daniel Rothberg in particular uh, for what was a really great day in terms of setting the context uh, and acknowledging the work that has been done throughout the history of the FSF with its partners, ASU and others, uh, to get us to a point where Security and Defence Plus can now be part of that broader contribution. Uh, I represent three universities, uh, Arizona State University, King's College London and University of New South Wales. And Security and Defence Plus was an idea born out of the AUKUS Agreement of September 2021 uh, and inspired by the work that had happened between those three universities via what is known as the PLUS Alliance, particularly in the areas of health uh, and engineering. The three university presidents imagined and saw an opportunity for how research and higher education in not only the AUKUS nations, but other friends and partner nations as well, can make a direct contribution to security and defence in the context of changing times. Uh, those three streams that came out of this organisation really do focus on research, education pathways and partnerships. And that's clearly relevant today uh, in this occasion when we talk about the contributions that think tanks, that the broader academic contribution and community, the political uh, cycles that all three countries find themselves in and the role of higher education and research in what I like to think of as the third leg of the three-leg national power stool when it comes to security and defence, the other two being, you know, defence and military power itself, and then government and industry in the broader context. So my role is to advocate on the part of the three universities, to encourage a debate around defence and security, to involve and inspire students uh, inside our universities and, you know, an age demographic more broadly, to be part of the solution set across our countries uh, as we move deeper into this century uh, and we're faced with the challenges that we know are coming. As it relates to AUKUS in particular, and I'll just take a little bit of time to talk about the relevance, which will be an important context for today. Many of you would be familiar with that September 2021 20, arrangement, ostensibly around two pillars. Pillar one being the delivery of a nuclear propelled submarine capability for Australia in the context of an alliance effort to be able to maintain the balance of power, particularly in the undersea domain in the Indo-Pacific. That's pillar one. Pillar one extends the s and arc of history out of the US, particularly in that domain, to include Australia in a very exclusive club alongside the United Kingdom to provide a deterrent capability that by any set of objective analysis is seen as critical to maintaining peace and security globally uh, across certainly the next couple of decades and deeper into this century. Pillar one comes with significant challenge, not only for Australia, but for all three countries. And we're seeing elements of that 
uh, from everything, including increasing the capacity of the, uh, the shipyards here to, to, to up the throughput of Virginia-class submarine in the first instance, to be able to understand the role that Barrow and Finesse in the UK will play as it relates to not only uh, the United Kingdom's future surface warfare and undersea program in terms of production capacity, but also what that might mean for Australia in the second decade. Uh, and then in my part of the world, it's about a whole new shift that includes an event horizon that sees Australia not only contributing to an alliance framework that it values and has done so since really the Second World War, but also leading insofar as building the kind of workforce skill, the technology sets, the aspiration to be able to you know, shape and contribute and respond to security and defence in our part of the world as a co-equal to our other allies and partners in so doing. So Pillar 1 comes with great ambition and great opportunity. Research, higher education plays a significant role in that. For Australia in particular, we have to go from zero to about 30,000 in terms of a stewardship workforce in the next 15 to 20 years. That can't be done without the assistance of universities, of think tanks, and those that need to skill the workforce that is coming. In relation to Pillar 2, and I'm sure many of you would be aware of what it entails, but those emerging offset asymmetric technology sets, again, are seen as part of the success dividend of what military deterrence and capability looks like, uh, not only now, but again, moving deeper into this century. When you think about automation, when you think about AI, when you think about quantum, when you think about alternates to precision navigation timing, you can't have that conversation without understanding the important role that research, that science, that technology plays in being able to arrive at a capability in an applied context before somebody else does. And again, that's an arms race, it's a space race, it's now a technology race in the way that we have done this before throughout the 20th century and the challenge that lays before us now. Part of what I think the FSS seeks to do is to apply the context and certainly what SD Plus is charged to do is to bring the collective capacity of all three of those universities plus the university and higher education sectors of all three countries in particular to bear on these grand problems. It's about having an event horizon, a North Star that we are part of in terms of contributing to defence and national security beyond just a military platform or a specific problem. This is about changing the nature of what we do and responding to the circumstances that we now find ourselves in. So that's what SD does. And certainly, again, we look forward to continuing to develop our partnerships, our education pathways, and our research opportunities in that regard. Uh, the forum today really is focused on uh, us being able to elevate and lift our perspective beyond. Uh, how we all contribute in the defence and security context to think about the broader issues uh, in that context. And we've got a great series of panels today that really are interactive in nature. And by that, I mean uh, the panellists will be encouraged by the moderators to speak. And then we look forward to having questions from particularly here in the room, but also those online, to really stimulate a conversation about where the need is as it relates to a particular topic. So if it's political resiliency, if it's intelligence sharing, if it's about alliances and partnerships, if it's about industry, if it's about the Indo-Pacific region, if it's about understanding from Kevin Rudd, for example, uh, his high level view at the ambassadorial level, uh, what opportunities, what challenges, what threats and what strengths lie across the task that we all have in the next 10 to 15 years, today is the day to do it. And today really is also the start of the conversation. So we will have deliberate breaks uh, in between our panels where the aim is to develop those networks, the fireside chats, the coffee breaks, the quiet conversations, the exchange of business cards. That's all the virtue of having these sorts of activities. So please see value in those breaks to be able to share information, understand perspectives, and to be able to work towards some sort of community of enduring practice going forward. Uh, just a couple of housekeepings. As I said, we'll have breaks. I will essentially MC throughout the day. Um, the, uh, the moderators will introduce their various panels. Um, we will try and stick to time. Uh, we've got Kevin right here after lunch. Again, he's on a very fixed window, so I'd appreciate if we could have everyone organised um, for that activity. We've got books for sale outside. And again, the aim today is discourse and networking. And that's our role here. 
So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, our first panel moderator, Professor Wynne Bowen, and uh, us, I beg your pardon, Dr Jennifer Moroni on the political resilience of August. You can have a break there, Wynne, and go back to sleep. Uh, and we will kick off on what promises to be a very fulfilling day. Thanks very much. Thank you.